rethink how we address agriculture and a lot of the things that we do. This session this afternoon, it's an hour and a half, it's actually divided into a lot of interesting bits and pieces with interesting, challenging, thought-provoking, but also very active panelists. One of the panelists that I met today told me, I'm gonna be disruptive, and I told her, please do. Be as disruptive as you want, because that is the type of session that we actually learn something from. Nobody came to Agra to hear the same things over and over again, and this group keeps coming, because here you keep getting the things that will help you continue to do better when you go home. The session is about resilience. We're going to be talking about resilience from two different angles. The first one is really gonna be looking at resilience in general, the different shocks, the different ways in which resilience can be increased for smallholder farmers, the different ways in which it has actually worked, or the challenges that still exist to ensure that resilience is actually a reality and that those sure shocks and stresses that will happen no matter how much we wanna close our eyes and wish them away, that we're actually able to deal with them. The second session will focus more specifically around one particular challenging and very overpowering uh, shock, and that is climate change. So we're going to have, at first, a keynote uh, panel, uh, a keynote address that's going to frame resilience for us, because I'm sure as the five or 600 people we are in this room, we might each have a different definition of what resilience means for us in the work that we do in the context in which we operate. So that keynote is going to frame the debate for us, after which we're going to have a first panel that's going to last about 30 minutes, which is really going to be looking at what different actors are doing and the experiences that they've seen on the ground that can be really useful. A diverse panel, people in policy, people who are farmers, people who are implementing policy, and the second panel as well is going to bring to the table a diverse set of actors from the farmer to the policymaker, from the government to the intergovernmental institutions. So without further ado, I would like to invite our keynote speaker, Honorable Christina Duarte, former minister of uh, Cape Verde, Minister of Finance of Cape Verde. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, please bear with me. I have 10 minutes to deliver five points. I don't know if I can have my only one slide projected. Thank you. So, first, the concept, common ground for the debate. Second, a previous and provocative note. Third, what we know, common knowledge built in the past 20 years around this subject. Fourth, why have we Africans been missing the necessary action to build resilience on food systems particularly on social agriculture systems, and the last one, building resilience on social agriculture systems. The concept, and I'm just going to read it. Resilience is the ability of a system, community, or society exposed to shocks to resist, absorb, accommodate to, and recover from the effects of this shock in a timely and efficient manner including through the preservation and restoration of its essential basic structures and functions. I think this is a quite simple and clear definition. It's from the United Nations. The prov provocative note. As you all know, resilience debate has done its first steps 20 years ago. Only in the past five years has been incorporated on action plans, 20 years, five years. But African history is a resilience life proof. African societies have been dealing with resilience in the past 200 years. Vulnerability has been our way of being in this planet. And consequently, resilience is definitely our business. But things now are different. What has changed? Now shocks have planetary consequences. They no longer affect only Africa. Many coming from climate change and political instability. Third point, what we know. So common knowledge. First, 
We know that smallholders are the backbone of the social agriculture systems, generating about 80% of the production, consequently playing an important custodian role of the agro-system. So they are the main actors. Nevertheless, they have been marginalized from the decision-making process at all levels. Second, we know that to build the resilience in order to fight anger, poverty, and the rational use of natural resources requires collective action, co-management, community-based management. So marginalizing smallholder farmers might not be the best approach. Third, we know that disasters and crises have short-term effects, which call for, the, for emergency intervention. But at the same time, they undermine national development gains that have been taken years to build. Example, the outbreak of Ebola. Fourth, we know that for decades, inequality and chronic vulnerability have deeply permeated social agriculture systems in Africa. African households, communities, and governments are less able today to absorb, recover, and adapt, making them more vulnerable to future shocks. Fifth, we know that we should not blame lack of financial resources. The problem lies much before. The lack of financial resources reflects lack of leadership and ownership, and lack of political will to establish planning, program, budgeting, and evaluation systems on a consistent way to create the necessary fiscal space to invest on social and human capital. And there is only one financing source that can address in a very sharp way this challenge, domestic resource mobilization. Sixth, we know that Without resilient agriculture livelihoods, it will be very difficult to achieve 2063 agenda. So, we know about everything. Therefore, the question to be addressed is not the deficit of knowledge, but the lack of action. Fourth point, why have we Africans been missing the necessary action to build resilience on food systems, particularly on social agriculture systems. In my opinion, you have been functioning under wrong frameworks in terms of policy making. Why? First, we need to move from managing poverty to manage wealth. Agnes. Agnes, my friend, you in 2016, you state a strong sentence. You state, Africa needs agriculture to do much more than provide food security in 2016. And this is exactly to move from poverty, managing poverty to managing wealth. So it is a mindset issue in the African policy making field. And this is strategically important in building resilience in the social agriculture system, particularly that everybody now, today, is talking about green revolution. Our starting point as Africans should be, we do have the resources. This should be our starting point. We do have the resources. Something else is missing, not the resources. So, we do have land, water, young population, market, middle class. We even have illicit flows. <laughs> we have capital fly flows. Patient funds, international reserves. So, something else is missing. Second, we need to move from short-term approach to long-term interventions. Long-term interventions are the only way to establish a crisis and, re and risk governance structure that involves all the stakeholders 
of the agriculture cluster, and consequently is the only way to build resilience. Please, this is not to create another organization, no. It's to create institutions. Institutions and organizations are completely two different concepts. Institutions are values, principles, norms, procedures, process. So we need to go beyond structures, beyond organizations. We need to move from deciding without information to deciding with information. Because information is out there. Just ask big data. Information is out there. We have no more excuses. National information systems, please, national, I'm not talking about public. National information systems have become a must, where national statistics systems are just a part of that. Fourth, we need to add to north-south partnerships the south-south partnerships, regional resilience strategies, shocks from climate change or domestic instability do not respect political borders. They follow geoculture dynamics. Fifth, we need to understand that resilience is more than a function of macroeconomic stability. I read a couple of papers linking too much resilience to macroeconomic stability. Resilience is more a function of income redistribution policies where national budgets and associated resource allocation are at the center of the challenge. We need to understand that resilience requires community empowerment through social and human capital building. The last point, building resilience on social agriculture systems. First, to build resilience goes beyond crop diversification, irrigation spread out, productivity increase, or agriculture yields. Agriculture is a socio-ecological system. Second, to build resilience calls for building social and human capital and understanding that food systems are more than value chains. They are socio-ecological systems. And the ecological sustainability results directly from the level of human capital. Social and human capital addresses the non-monetary dimension of poverty, and they are an important requirement to build capacity in terms of absorption, recovery, adaptation, and transformation, the four dimensions of resilience. Third, it is about time for the resilient thinking, again, absorption, recover, adaptation, and transformation, feed the policy making in Africa, particularly in terms of gathering, processing, and analyzing data. In general terms, and I hope I'm not offending anyone in this room, policy making in Africa has been done on a dark basis with very few information no data treatment, so too much guessing. Improving the decision-making process, building structured scenarios, promoting active adaptive management, and embracing long-term thinking to tackle transformative solutions. And this is planning in an interactive, systemic, and holistic way. This calls for a policy-making reboot, reset in Africa in order to move from a reactive response to crisis to a pro proactively preventing and anticipating them. Fourth, resilience bridges short-term emergency with long-term development interventions. Zero hunger, ecological sustainability, climate change adaptation and inclusive socioeconomic development cannot be achieved without resilient agriculture livelihoods. In terms of conclusions, I would say very quickly, 
resilience requires institutions. Policy making in Africa, they need to start paying attention to the intangible side or intangible dimension of development. It's very nice to build roads, bridges, uh, railroads, but please, it's time to pay attention to the intangible side of development, institutions. Second requires innovation, the need to leapfrog. Third, intentionality for the actors, no ad hoc approach, through consistent and persistent action. Fourth, collective action and co-management. Last, reboot of the policy making. You need to reset it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Duarte. We are in the business of resilience. Um, and as such, without making any comment on the presentation, as do, I do have a panel that is here to do just that and to share more about what they're doing around resilience and whether or not those key elements are actually part of how they're thinking intentionally about resilience and not being ad hoc. I would like to welcome my first panel, starting with Berlin Chitsunge. Please come on, who's the CEO of El Paso Farms. She's also a Pan-African food ambassador of the Pan-African Parliament, a commercial farmer. I'd like to invite Mr. Sean Jones, who's the deputy, senior deputy assistant administrator, uh, the Bureau of Food Security of USAID. I'd like to invite Dalika Banda, the CEO of Africa Risk Capacity. Erica Jorgensen, WFP regional director for East and Central Africa. And Simeon Eul, director for Africa of the World Bank. Please help me in welcoming them. Hello. Good Hello. How are you all doing? Fine. We are in the business of resilience. So let's talk about the business of resilience. And I would like to start with WFP, Erica. And I'd like to start with you because a lot of things were said earlier in the presentation about the intentionality, but also about the long-term process of building resilience. And we know WFP a lot responds to crises, not just that. But how does WFP ensure that in responding to necessary crises and in responding to the shocks that do happen, that resilience is also a very clear part of the planning, of the research, of the implementation to ensure that communities, countries are left more resilient? Thank you, Valerie. Um, and as you said, you know, I WFP is known for saving lives and uh, responding to emergencies. Our priority is saving lives, but our top priority is if we can save lives and at the same time leverage this by supporting smallholders, giving them means, knowledges, opportunity, connecting them with markets and with private sector. Um, just, to, just to get you um, an idea of the volume of this, last year WFP procured 350,000 tons of food in East Africa from local and regional farmers, uh, from cooperatives and, and uh, communities. And that's the largest amount in any region in the world. That also gives us opportunity. It's also a challenge because we have to have, we have to meet quality standards and we can't afford to break our pipelines. We still have to save lives. Um, it's, it's, no, let, me give you, let me just give you an example in, instead of getting lost in, in words here. Uh, I was recently in Somalia to mark that we had bought 2,500 tons of food from, from farmers. This is not an easy thing to do in Somalia where you of course have a lot of conflict, etc., and instability. It, the story started very briefly three years ago when we bought 200 tons of quality maize from cooperatives. That's not a lot. 200 tons is not a lot. Next year, we couldn't buy their product because they were infested by aflatoxin. And the year after, there was a drought, so we also couldn't get anything. Meanwhile, the farmers were trained by partners in good farming methods and practices and in post-harvest management. This year, we bought 2,500 metric tons of food. And that's a yeah. good story. I know it's not a big one, but it gives hope, and it gave the motivation to the farmer cooperatives, and they told me that they are now planning to start thinking vertical farmings, 
they are starting to think hydroponics, they are already uh, starting to think milling okay. facilities. Just, just one, one more question related to that. Those are amazing examples of success at a, a scale that you're saying is not enough, but it's still something that can be celebrated. This was done by supporting the farmers themselves. But as WFP, as an intergovernmental institution, are you also playing a role to ensure or to support in terms of the policy framework that allows for more support of farmers beyond just training them, that can allow to accompany farming processes beyond just a, a specific farming community or beyond a specific cooperative? It's something we are discussing with our partners in particular. I mean, we are, of course, we're trying to influence also that red tape is, is cut for, uh, for smallholders. I mean, there's a significant gap between the institutional and policy framework and the speed at which new technologies and initiatives are, are released. Mm -hmm. And as, as John Muller said this morning, you know, the, the politicians, the leaders need to embrace and to stand central um, in the support for smallholders, and, and it's a real investment that they Thank need. Thank you. Thank you. I'll come now to you, uh, Sean Jones. Um, the USA does have a food security program. There's a lot of things that you've been thinking. How does that sound to you? What is your take on resilience, and how is that permeating in the way that you're funding, in the way that you're supporting uh, agriculture systems beyond the food aid or beyond um, more ad hoc, if I may say that, I don't know that that's what sure. you're doing, I'm just giving an example. But could not. you talk to us a little bit about how you're making sure that resilience is integrated and is intentional in the, the work that USAID does? Of course, well thank you. Um, it is a key part of our food security intervention. So food, uh, USAID has a rather broad definition maybe compared to some other donors uh, with regard to food security. So it's not just agriculture. We're also ensuring that nutrition, uh, access uh, to safe and secure water, um, uh, and then nutrition. Uh, key aspects of nutrition in our daily diet are met through uh, all of our interventions. And so what we are doing is we have learned over time through our resilience activities uh, that when you sequence them and when you layer these in some of the most vulnerable communities, uh, that there are certain successes, but also there are successes that we can apply to the rest of our programming uh, across the across the sphere. So, what I what I in our food security world, USAID has the benefit of working in not only from the humanitarian assistance side, but we work all the way through into our long-term development programming. Our resilience programming, as for, for for the U.S. government, is that connective tissue in between. Mm -hmm. It's ensuring that our investments in resilience are leading to and protecting, if you will, uh, the, the future investments in food security while also helping to pull communities, households, mm -hmm. uh, and countries out of that humanitarian assistance trap. Just on, on the one thing that you said, starting and continuing through sustainability, do you start before the shocks or do you start at the shocks and continue? So we start before the shocks. Okay. Um, ultimately, the way we define resilience uh, is by helping communities, households, countries, regions uh, to uh, have, this, have the ability to adapt, to cope mm -hmm. uh, with one or multiple shocks that are li very likely recurring in nature. Mm -hmm. They are health shocks, they are the loss of, a, of the wage earner in the household, mm -hmm. uh, certainly they're climate related uh, uh, shocks, uh, conflict related shocks. Okay. Working in those kinds of communities where we've seen a trend over time okay. uh, and ensuring that our investments are leading them more towards a path of longer term development. Okay. Thank you. I'll come now to you, Berlin. You said you were going to disrupt this conversation. <laughs> um, so she's the one, if you were wondering who told me that. And I'm looking forward. What's interesting is you are an ambassador um, for the Pan-African Parliament, but you're also a farmer yourself. And I think what I would like to ask you is what, is, what you've heard so far, what does that make a difference in your farming? How does that change the way you operate? Or do you operate in a way that is not being considered, that is not being thought about in terms of the support that you and your fellow farmers uh, are seeing as necessary to make sure that you withstand the shocks? But also, what are you doing yourself as a farmer? Um, thank you very much. Um, if you may allow me to take the ambassadorial suit off and put my uh, my work suit on the overalls as a farmer, and I'd like to speak from a farmer's perspective. I mean, to start off with, we talked about how farming should be now. 
I've been saying I'm a farmer, and I am indeed a farmer. And I've been asked, what is a farmer supposed to look like? Are you a farmer? And I said, yes. What is a farmer supposed to look like? Old? Wrinkles? Spade? Donkey? No, this is the 21st century farmer you're looking at today. The journey hasn't been easy at all. Yes. I must say the journey has not been easy at all. I've emerged from a small holder farmer to now what you call a commercial farmer in South Africa. It has taken me seven years to get to that commercial level, which we was given the recognition last year. So this is my eighth year farming, but um, I'm still learning how to farm and it doesn't stop there. When we talk about resilience, it's the capacity to recover quickly from a tough situation. But are we also looking at the psychological resilience? How do we recover? as farmers, and uh, when we talk about farming, the time that it takes for you to recover, the next planting season is already there. So how do we get help and where do we get help from? And um, it hasn't been easy, I must say, it's a lonely journey that farmers travel, and um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm here speechless. I've been traveling this journey for quite some time, before even my ambassador role. I was uh, in the Netherlands, the first climate agriculture, uh, conference. I was also zero hunger in Vietnam. I was also in uh, the U.S. as well. I was on COP17. I've been there. I was in um, uh, Cote d'Ivoire last year as well on this very same platform. But um, for me, I just think the now is a need for us to start thinking differently, as the Honourable Min former Minister of Cap um, Kirkford said earlier that what are the ways that we now have to start looking at? To start off with, policymakers they. Uh, craft these policies with the exclusion of the farmer. So we are marginalized. We are expected to incorporate those um, uh, policies. So perhaps what we should be asking for is facilitators to then facilitate those policies and financial instruments to the rural poor, to the rural setting where it's needed. And we could also look at ICT. Perhaps that's also another alternative. Surely in any village, there could be just one person with a cell phone. So we could use that platform as well to get information across. But uh, apart from that, it's a very lonely journey. We can have as many conferences as we can, but I think we need to start seeing a greater representation of more farmers and in particular the youth, which is very important. I think we've missed it and we most probably in this situation because the past never prepared us. So perhaps we should now take all this into the classroom to the five-year-old in 2050, 2063. That's our heads of state are putting that vision. These youngsters will be our age group. So we need to start focusing on that. Before I move over, um, and I'm going to go and, and, and talk about the financial instruments with the World Bank, and you know I'm looking your way over there and the ICT, but just to give people a perspective, because you see you've been on this journey for eight years, and from a smallholder farmer to now a commercial farm, what does that look like? What, what did you start with, and what are you with now? in terms of the, the size and scope of your operation? Because it's, it's always good to know when we have, we say smallholder farmer, what does that mean? When we say commercial, what does that mean? I started with very few goats. Actually, before I even bought the farm, renting a place with just 32 goats. And um, I joined uh, Grifica, which is a consultant group. And we went into Tanzania. We acquired 46,000 hectares of land. And we're going to put a 23,000 um, cattle feedlot there and 800 daily slaughter abattoir and what have you. We were frustrated. Then one day I looked around and I thought, we all consultants. None of us are farmers. So then I just thought to myself, why not look for a farm and buy a farm and so that one day like today I can speak from a farmer's perspective to be honest with you I'm not so sure whether I like consultants or not because <laughs> what we're talking about then it's almost impossible to do 800 daily slaughter you need to start with about 200 million cows so we were not talking uh, a lot of sense there. So it's very important even for consultants to get um, the right mindset. So as I started, um, it wasn't easy, but then, you know, being a woman, I think that also helped a lot. And my educational background, I got a PhD in molecular medicine, that has helped me as well to find my markets and to find other things, but- uh, What is the size of your farm now? What do you farm? I'm farming with uh, cattle, uh, registered Bonsmara and uh, Goonies as well, and I'm also a Kalahari red a goat breeder, which uh, I've been exporting as far as Thailand, Nigeria, Tanzania, and I'm also doing a lot of quails and ducks, and more so recently, a lot of vegetables and um, supplying the supermarket chain stores. So um, I am successful today, but not just by myself. The key to it, to success, 
is getting assistance from the people who have the knowledge. I've had to use my neighbors who have been farming for a very long time for me to acquire the skills. I would not be the half the farmer that I am today without the knowledge. Thank so you. education is very important as well. Yeah. Thank you. Now, Mr. Simo, and I take this opportunity. Um, I should have mentioned that earlier. S'il y a des gens dans la salle qui parlent français et qui ont besoin d'écouteurs, je vous demanderai de lever la main pour qu'on vous les en donne, au cas où vous n'avez pas encore pris uh, de quoi avoir une traduction. Just for the translator, just raise your hand, levez la main, et on vous donnera um, des, des écouteurs pour pouvoir uh, écouter. Donc, so I'm coming to you, the World Bank. She was very clear in some of the things that are necessary, and I speak to the World Bank, but also, I guess, to USAID and all the funders that are in the room that also support these initiatives, and in terms of financial instruments that are really adapted to the entire chain, to the small scale holder, but as well as to the commercial farms. And not all of them have the opportunity, as she said, to have the level of education, the level of access to resources that she would have, for example, although even with that, it was a difficult journey. So, from a World Bank perspective, what what are you putting in place from a financing perspective that can support the entire chain and ensure resilience at different levels? Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Valerie, and good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's really um, a pleasure you know, uh, to be here. Uh, let me take a step back a little bit and build on what uh, you know, Christina Drote said earlier in terms of uh, the, the resilience. Basically, I mean, uh, uh, we all know that um, majority of people derive the livelihood basically from the food systems, for, okay? And that if the resilience of the food system actually fails, we all fail. That's the fact. The, 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 if, you know, from, uh, you know, if the, the, the food system were an athlete and it had to run a long distance, you know, race with obstacles, I can tell you that uh, that athlete will fail today. It will fail because the system is not ready to actually face a lot of the challenges. So we need to continue to actually face those challenges and, and help to solve them. Mm -hmm. So I give an example. Let's look at uh, the fall army you know, uh, worm that's happening in Africa today. With all the data indicate like that it could potentially affect some 12 countries with some you know, maize loss of, uh, you know, several, you know, eight million, you know, metric ton or so. And, and what this means that is a lot of money, resources, and income that are going away from, uh, from the potential farmers. The question is, what do we do mm -hmm. on that? At the World Bank, we're not just, uh, you know, a financial institution. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to mention that because we are a development institution, mm -hmm. which means that what we do, just like also all the multilateral organizations, we provide, provide knowledge mm -hmm. as well as resource and money, okay? And facilitate, if you want, access to money by other institutions. So number one, for us, is to, like uh, Madame just mentioned, the education. Mm -hmm. Do we have the right skills to be able to have a, a robust, resilient food system? That's, I think, a major constraint that we are working on, and I can come back to that a little bit later. The second is, how are we adjusting to be able to really take up and adopt some of those emerging technologies that are coming now, even based on you know, ICT, digital you know, type of technologies, to be able to face the challenges, okay? And third, the question is, you know, how much you know, are we helping in, in the area of policies? And Dr. just mentioned that earlier. Okay, and there are many, how much are we equipping the SMEs and so on to be able to actually get, you know, the necessary financing to actually uh, uh, okay. uh, uh, meet, if you want, uh, or, or be robust enough to be able to, to face the challenge of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, the resilience. Mm -hmm. So at the World Bank, just to answer Valerie, your question, it's not just a question of, uh, of financing. Mm -hmm. We have a, a wide range of uh, financial instruments but the key to me is actually the knowledge that we bring to the people, to the beneficiaries. And that's where okay. we do have a lot of corporate advocacy. If you have money, anybody can give money. Absolutely. However, 
one of the things that was specifically requested, and I'm trying to get us to not just everything that we are doing as institution or everything that we should be doing, but in the room today, a lot of people are looking at, so what do I come to you for? What can I get access to in terms of knowledge? So being quite intentional and specific about the types of services you're offering to different institutions, be the government, being directly to smallholder farmers, being to private sector, so that as we continue this conversation, we start making those links already, because people may know this is all the World Bank does, or USAID, or the Africa Risk Capacity, and I'm coming to you just now, Dalika, but very clearly, how can we make those linkages so we move the conversation for this other challenge and this is what we should be doing to this is what we are doing and together. So I'll come back to you on that in a minute where we're Thank pushing you. with time. But I do want to come to, to Dalika, uh, Africa Risk Capacity, very clearly that are working with government as I understand it, but also perhaps how does that impact um, on the, the smallholder farmer? And that's really providing insurance to um, states and to nations to support some of the risk that they may not be financially or otherwise carry on their own. What specifically are you offering and how can that partnership grow? How can that be made stronger in a way that it will trickle down to farmers, be it commercial or smallholder farmers? Thanks very much, Valerie. Um, I'm actually wearing two hats today. One is the African Risk Capacity, which is an insurance company set up uh, under the agency, under the auspices of the Africa Union. The second is as a board member of the Africa Enterprise Challenge Fund. Okay. Both of these organizations have significant impact on building wealth, creating wealth, preserving wealth, and therefore building resilience into the small holder Farmer, household, they could be non-farmers, but the, the most vulnerable in our populations. Mm -hmm. I usually start this conversation by asking the room, which one in this room, which one of us does not have any insurance of any sort whatsoever? And I'll be damned if there'll be a hand that will go up, because we all have insurance. And insurance is perceived in many circles to be an evil thing. We take money from people, we park it with reinsurance companies in the international world, and when it's needed, it's not there. It is merely a component of a national risk framework that every country, and particularly countries in our region, on this continent, ought to put in place. There are other mechanisms, Insurance is just one way of transferring risk off the national balance sheet. Madame Duarte talked about the disruption in the fiscus when you do have a disaster, because money has got to go from a hospital or an education project to go and resuscitate households as quickly as possible. The bank has done some studies that say early intervention is key. In the event of a drought, intervention within the first three months is seven to ten dollars intervention that is done nine months later. Mm. So that early intervention, and we are seasonal, our smallholders are all seasonal, is extremely important. Mm -hmm. And African risk capacity is about helping our countries. We don't just sell the insurance company. We actually work with our governments very early on for a period of 12, 12 to 18 months mm -hmm. for a new country to help them to put in place a national framework that says how do we identify the risks we carry, how do we finance for those risks ex ante, and how do we have an agreement which includes WFP in some cases of if an event happens, this is how we will distribute the cash that is going to come from the insurance product. Okay. And thereafter, how do we hold the government accountable that that distribution was done according to what they had said it would be done. There's an external audit. Okay. What that does is that you make sure that monies reach where they're supposed to reach very, very quickly and help our countries to rebound and rebound better. Mm -hmm. Households otherwise will sell their crop, they will stop children going to school, nutrition gets affected. Mm -hmm. So for us, the African risk capacity is not to sell the insurance product. It is to really make sure that households are resilient, rebounding and rebounding better than they were before. Okay. On the Africa Enterprise Challenge Fund side, it is a very innovative way, as is the African risk capacity, to get smallholders, and the bulk of our portfolio is agri, 
and very working very closely with AGRA, actually. We came out of AGRA as a project. Um, and there the idea is to help smallholder farmers to escalate. We're almost like an incubator. We advise, we give the knowledge, we do the technical assistance with the help of our funders, which include most of the international donors. I won't mention all of them because I may, I may miss out some and offend, but we've got a lot of the international donors who have okay. seeded it. But for me, the point I'd like to make is, we thank the donors, the money is out there, but it is time for us. A revolution is not a slow moving thing. Mm -hmm. A revolution is something that addresses a burning platform. Mm -hmm. We've got to add urgency to this conversation. Okay, let me stay with you on that question because that's the question I'm gonna ask each of you as we barely have five minutes and this is not a good thing because I want to continue grilling this conversation forward. So let me ask you and the others think about it as it's coming your turn. You're saying a revolution is not a slow thing. And a revolution requires that we each also be clear on our responsibility and the things that we can, as individuals and as institutions perhaps, do better and what we would like another to do. So to make the revolution fast, efficient, effective, what would you do? What is the one thing that you would do? And what would you ask another? And who's that other to do? Just two points, if we can go very The one quickly. thing I will ask everybody in this room is to talk to every government that you belong to or are affiliated or associated with to really think about offsetting the risks, planning ex ante, and building the financial wherewithal, which, is, which the ultra extreme is humanitarian aid. Okay. And but the early you? side is pre-planning. What would you do? I am now going on a plane from <laughs> here to Zambia to Zimbabwe, and I think Zimbabwe was supposed to be on this panel, I wish he had been, to try and get them to sign the treaties and buy these policies. Okay, That's thank what you. I'm doing. Erica, Ooh. <laughs> how do we make this revolution quick and efficient so that we don't keep saying the same things for the next 20 years? Yeah, I mean, adding to knowledge and, and to technology, which, is, which has to be there uh, for, to build resilience and, and resilient people and households is to, to wish for uh, peace and stability, of course, to access to, to infrastructure, to embrace the new generation of young people and get knowledge and education to them. Um, we should do that. But also, as, as us, mm -hmm. and what, because I saw it, you're mm -hmm. going to, what will you do? Yes. I will <laughs> promise to use every opportunity to, to link farmers to markets. To, to give farmers these opportunities they have, however, however cumbersome it may be, and in an intelligent and thoughtful and sustainable way. Thank you. Simeon? Yeah. Three things to make the revolution happen. And we have to learn from history, because it has happened already elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Look at the case of India. How they went from sheep to mouth to a green revolution. Let's look at the case of Brazil. Mm -hmm. How did they become the largest you know, food market, in, in world food market after the US? Look at the case of Thailand. How this country, tiny country, has a food value that is higher than the total food value of Africa. Mm -hmm. It has to do with the investment they put in agricultural education. For me, this is critical, critically important. Agricultural universities, knowledge, need to be embedded in what we're doing. Second, we need to be able to reduce the gap between you know, technology that are emerging now and their uptake by the people. And that's where public institutions like a World Bank, government, private sector need to come in. Finally, and it was mentioned earlier in a panel, you know, Olga Cryer mentioned it, the issue about policies, our government policies, and again, I keep citing it because I like what she said, is that it is done in a haphazard manner. There's no consistency in policy. Yes, and those three, if they're yeah. to happen and make it quick, what are you doing? Me? How are you going to push for those to happen? As an individual, as a staff member of the World Bank, yes. what we are doing is exactly to provide resources experiences and knowledge, work with the government to make this happen. So like we are developing a regional agriculture education program in Africa, together with the Rural Forum. Okay. We have regional agriculture productivity programs that are speeding up the adoption of technologies in some countries. Okay, 
and we are developing a, 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 a policy capacity you know, mechanism together with AGRA, the Gate Foundation, and others in Africa. Okay. This is what we are doing to be Thank able you. to make it happen. And that's my commitment. Thank you. Sean? Um, so I, I have to ask myself, in, in places like Burkina Faso and Niger, how, how we're seeing over 250,000 hectares of land being naturally regenerated because of these kinds of projects. How um, in Malawi, uh, $1 invested is resulting in uh, $2.90 of humanitarian assistance expenditures averted. Um, and how in Ethiopia, um, communities are, are rebounding in the face of fall armyworm um, and other threats. Um, there are two things that I really want to highlight. One is that we have realized, and we've known this for a long time, but our systems don't necessarily allow us to do this. We can't do this alone. And so we must, we need partners. We need those organizations and those companies that are working to mitigate risk. We need the multilaterals that are, that are also bringing in their resources, the private companies, and certainly the communities. And then second, the, we need to be ensuring that we're following the evidence that's associated with our efforts. We need to be learning from the mistakes we're making almost in real time and then adapting uh, uh, right away uh, so that our programming for the next growing cycle uh, is better than the, than the failures we might have seen in the last growing cycle. Um, and what I, what I plan to do um, uh, personally is I want to make sure uh, that we are taking the lessons learned uh, from all of these things into our partnerships um, around the world and that we're truly providing an integrated set of of um, offerings to communities based on what they need, not on what the donor is able to or wants to provide at a certain time. It's based on what they need. Thank you. And Rilin, I'll give you the last word. Thank you. Um, well, maybe this I could say it's directed to Madam President, Dr. Agnes, um, that I will not be leaving Kigali without answers to take to my fellow contemporaries, the farmers, maybe they're not small older farmers, perhaps we should start calling them smart farmers. Maybe we need to start changing that mindset as well. So for me, I want to know what is it that is different that I can take away today uh, or the next few days out there and uh, leverage on. But certainly I'm sure, you know, um, as we continue with platforms like this, um, I've just realized that collaborations, partnerships, linkages, very, very important and um, also um, I'm thinking the rebooting exercise is very, very important, and I think that's the starting point. So perhaps as aware of going forward, we should start revisiting. Let's go back, and then let's reboot, and then let's now leapfrog to the next stage and um, see how we can get the farmers involved and um, for them to play a meaningful role in delivering the, um, the promise. I mean, for example, um, insurances. We're talking about insurances. I've been speaking to banks in South Africa, and um, they're not interested in talking to the small older farmer because they've no collateral. But what we've done is to look at insurance companies if they got a group of, uh, well, a, few, a lot of uh, smallholder farmers or smart farmers, and if they can avail insurance, risk insurance, then the banks have said that they'll look at um, reconsidering that. But from, um, from the ambassadorial role, um, I could say um, as a citizen of the continent, uh, one thing that we've done in South Africa now, the governments are beginning to listen. They've accepted that they're understaffed and they're short staffed, they overstaffed, overstaffed in the sense of people that have no knowledge in agriculture and understaffed with people who actually know what to do in agriculture. So what we've done in South Africa recently, which I would like to congratulate the South African government on for listening, um, we've actually created what you call a task team. And this task team is made up of uh, the agriculture department and the private sector, the commercial farmers and other stakeholders to assess the state's readiness for this planting season, okay. i.e. each province had to do a presentation to say how many hectares have they got, how many tractors have they got, and the role of the task team is to see out of those tractors they're talking about, are they all functional or do they need uh, working on, and we've gone as far as saying we need to put some tracking devices because a lot of things are going missing, and also when you get inputs to the farm to the farmers what in what knowledge are you giving to the farmers we're hearing of people you're giving 
fertilizer. You told 300 kgs per hectare, and that's what you need for the good product. But then what does the farmer do? They sell off 250, they're left with 50 kgs. Why? Because we have not explained to them. So again, institutions, education, we need facilitators that can get all this information. We need ICT. We also need uh, people to help in the policy making. So I think um, on that note, I can just say thank you so much for this uh, opportunity to bring the farmer into the house. Um, at least we're beginning to have and to hear from a farmer's perspective, which is very, very important. But I think we need more farmers to be involved as well so that we can hear it from the farmers Great. themselves. Great, and you already have things that are being done. I mean, we, maybe we can put South Africa on the list of uh, countries that uh, Dalika is visiting after here, and mm -hmm. there's already discussions to be had with the World Bank around the knowledge sharing bit and the partnership that uh, the USAID is building and thinking how can that be expanded from the lessons that are coming here, and obviously just the, the, the relationship and the partnership that you're talking about. I want to just, um, in thanking you and the way uh, Ms. Duarte started, that on this continent we have all the resources that we need. We have the people, we have the natural resources, we have the content, we have the, the technology, it's about sharing it, it's about maximizing what we have to be able to make sure that in the next year, in the next five years, the conversation we'll be having around resilience will be different. So thank you all, and please Can I be help me. Thank you, Yi. Can thank I you. just be disruptive then? You, I thought you already had. Not That's really. More disruptive. Um, all please I want to say, on, I've summed up Africans that we are victims of our own success. There are only two things that are needed on the continent, organization and management. Let's organize ourselves and let's just manage ourselves and that's all that's needed, everything else we have. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, how was that? This, this, I can't see you guys doing this. Clap for them, come on. Be serious about your liking. Thank you. We're gonna move straight into to the next panel, uh, which I'm sure is just gonna be as engaging. Um, and I'll start with uh, calling Mr. Kisilu. Um, I have not seen Kisilu, but I know you're here. Please come on, please. Um, come and, and, and have a seat. Kisilu is a farmer and a filmmaker in, uh, in Kenya. I'd also like to call uh, Dr. Donald Brown, uh, who's the Associate Vice President um, of Program Management at IFAD, uh, Tony Simmons, Director General of the World Agroforestry Center, uh, Arne Cartridge from Yara International, Billy Vegashaw, Director General of Sustainable Development Goal Center in Africa, and Ambassador Ethrin Cousin, Distinguished Fellow, Global Agriculture, Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Is that a way of welcoming them? Come on. And I even hear voices, thank you. As we start this panel, before I actually sit down with them, again, it's a panel as diverse as the first panel, and this one is going specifically talk about climate change and the challenges of climate change. And for that to sort of put us really into the reality of it because we tend to look at the policy and policy is one of the major challenges, not in terms of really developing policy but also in terms of implementing policy. <coughs> but beyond that, it is really being reminded that the policies that we're talking about, the practices, the partnerships that we're talking about is really about how it affects real people as humans. Um, and for that, because we have Kisilu here also as a filmmaker, uh, we're going to show you a trailer that sort of puts us in perspective of this, the discussion that we're going to have today. When the rains fails, every farmer feels like running away. Christine, what can you say about rain today? No, I think when we look on the sky, it seems as if it will rain soon. Are you happy with it? I'm very happy with it because it's the mother of all living things. You can be in bad terms with your family members. 
hearing that you have nothing for their bellies. And unfortunately, that is a very big problem to some people and to me. Yeah, that was it. We in big people, you know? Amen. Couldn't you me? Like you didn't know where to get a me, that I can let me change. Well, what are you allowed, Guadiala? No, you know, with the we get as I even was, gets a good one, dear Lila, then good tea and media and on the woman. No, no, we don't ever go on, we have a Season, we were crying, no rain. Now we are talking of blood. Everything is being contradicted. It's crunch time at the COP21 in Paris. The objective and requirements are clear. We need a universal agreement on climate. I'm going for my family's future. This is my chance to share my story. The story that I have is an alarm to everybody. They have polluted our atmosphere for 200 years, and their wealth is based upon our poverty. <laughs> What are the qualities of a good father? Who is a good leader? Are you nervous? No, no, no. Yeah, I'm not scared in any way. I'm ready. I'm ready. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kisilu, for for this. Uh, this is just a trailer. Uh, we didn't have time to show the entire movie, although I'm sure many would like to see the entire thing. And um, earlier, I had in the briefing with Kisilu, I told him I was not going to start with him. But now I think I want to start with you and ask you a simple question is, why are you doing this? Is beyond your own family, beyond your own, own disaster that you have seen in the challenges, why is this important for you? Mm. It was after seeing the challenges of the climate change, which are affecting my family, my wife, my kids. And then I developed a feeling of sympathizing with my family members. Mm -hmm. I started going up and down, visiting my villagers to see what is happening also with them, to find that everybody is being twisted by the climate changes impacts. So I developed, I, I went on developing the same feeling mm -hmm. and also seeing, feeling that I have to, to take the, the responsibility of solving this problem. I started with my own family, mm -hmm. then it grew up to the villagers. Absolutely, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I want us to start with that because I think uh, sometimes we have a policy discussion that's divorced from some of the, the conversations that are happening at the village or at the district or at the family level. Um, however, I do know that many organizations and many of your organizations are really looking at how to bridge the gap and how to make sure that the discussions that are happening at the international level are actually things that matter. Um, so I'll start with you, Dr. Belay. Uh, from a um, Sustainable Goal Development Center for Africa, how are you making the link so that, again, a lot of the conversations around policies that are not implemented, policies that do not involve farmers, or policies that are detached, how are you making sure that link actually is real? <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I mean, um, 
we're having this huge program called the SDGs. Um, this is 15 years program, as you all know. And uh, this is a very ambitious program as well. Um, it's, uh, it's aspiring, actually, everything that uh, we've been struggling for thousands of years to be um, able to meet it in 15 years. Um, this is a program that calls for food for all, energy for all, um, water to all, and all, all stuffs. And uh, the, the most important thing is, uh, <clears throat> I think, yes, the world agreed on, you know, 17 big goals, uh, you know, with 169 indicators and targets. Um, however, the world never agreed on the pathways. We don't know which pathway we will follow in order to be able to meet those, you know, goals and those targets. So this is worrisome. This is one thing that we are trying to actually, um, <clears throat> you know, see how we can, uh, you, know, domest you know, through domesticating the SDGs, we should be also able to um, come with something that um, helps to attain those goals and targets, but every and single um, intervention that we are using, uh, you know, for this should also make, you know, ensure um, that we have, you know, uh, answer for climate vulnerability, we have answer to build, uh, you know, the necessary and the required resilience at all levels. Okay. Um, the issue right now is um, we can only say that the SDGs are technically feasible, but when it comes to um, um, whether they are scientifically proven or not, um, this is one thing that we are struggling with. Um, because the fact that, you know, these are like 17 major goals and 169 major targets, even if we attain all these things at the same time, because the, the world never moved in this kind of, you know, highly convergent direction in the past, we don't know whether that will give us a safe planet or not. Okay. So I think the most uh, uh, relevant thing for this discussion is um, how actually to contextualize this thing and try to build you know, a system as an intervention that will help address both the targets and the goals, but at the same time also um, you know, resilience system at household and community okay. levels. I'd like to take it from the overall 17 goals now specifically around climate change um, and uh, come to you, um, Tony. Um, what are, because one of the things that Dr. Bailey was talking about is how difficult in terms of really mapping out what is the process and what needs to be in it. In terms of building resilience to climate change, what should be included in that process? What should we make sure? Because if we don't deal with it, we might be dealing with the flood or we might be dealing with the drought, but we're not dealing with some of the social and uh, other implications that need to be put in place for resilience to be a reality. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Valerie. Um, when we were invited onto this panel, our very charming moderator said we could show a few PowerPoint slides. However, because of the time and, and the resilience of you having to deal with all of these panels, we've cut those out. But I did want to show just one PowerPoint slide. And for those of you who can see it, <laughs> for those of you who can't see it, please go online and look at the difference between what happens with a one and a half degree change and a two degree change. It's so pronounced, the crop losses, the coral bleaching, the extent of heat waves, the extremity of floods, it's staggering. And that's a two degree world. And so if we're gonna have resilience against even starker problems uh, with our world and particularly with farming, we're really gonna have to ramp up the urgency and the scale. And that, that two degree world, if we push that to a four degree world, Valerie, we're going to end up with a four-letter outcome. Which brings me to the second point, which is about um, resilience is not just an ecological term. It's not just about environmental resilience. And Madame Duarte made that in, a, in her opening speech. Resilience is as much about social resilience, as much about financial resilience. And we've got to build those concepts in as we look at, at changing things. One of the most remarkable uh, examples of resilience and adaptation in the world is in northern Tigray in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. And here there was one community after the civil war, after the Derg, who realized that they were going to lose their land, they were going to be taken off it. And so they passed their own bylaw that for every adult in that village, 40 days had to be spent on their watershed, 1,500 hectares for 900 households supporting 1,000 hectares of cropland. 
40 days a year for free, um, planting trees, nurturing them, keeping livestock out, building check dams, build, stopping floods. And from that, from that social capital, that social resilience, came natural capital and is now prosperity. 900 households and now 1,300 youth have come back from the towns and cities to work in that village because there's enterprise, because there's water, because of that social investment. And the last point is how much it's going to cost. It's staggering. If we look at the pledges being made at the moment, they're enormous. But is it going to cost $50 a hectare, $100 a hectare, $1,000 a hectare? Well, at $1,000 a hectare, to restore 100 million hectares of African land is going to cost $100 billion. Do we have those resources to mobilize to make our agricultural systems more resilient? Because if we don't, we've got to look at the few priorities that we can address in that. And the important thing there is to be looking at the, these longer term trends and how we can mobilize capital, how we can de-risk the smallholder. I love USAID, I love the World Bank, I love IFAD. They're brilliant donors, all of that ODA. But for every single dollar of ODA, there's $3 of remittances in the developing world, $6 of foreign direct investment, $24 of domestic private sector spend, and $35 million of government expenditure and $1,000 of private capital. So we've got to use those $1, those very clever and free monies to leverage all of those other resources to make sure that our farming systems in Africa are more resilient. Thank you. Um, I'll now go to, to Ifad um, and hear about how you also involving in investing in the social capital, not just an ecological perspective, but what, is, what do the numbers say to you? both in terms of what's happening, but also in terms of the investment required to be able to build the resilience that, is, that we all uh, are in the business of. Thank you. Um, well, actually, I'd very much like to pick up from where Tony left off. I mean, IFAD tries to focus particularly on the poorest farmers in agriculture because, uh, you know, they're the ones that are going to be most affected. And actually, they're the ones least able to cope uh, because you know, the intensity of climate change now is so fast. You know, if you look back in the past, actually farmers are very good at adapting and coping, but the intensity is so fast now that it's actually impossible to do so and catch up. So that's where you know, the money and the social capital comes in. So from an EFAB perspective, as Tony says, you know, there will never be enough money to address these issues. And what we have to do is use the money intelligently um, and make sure that what we're providing is a catalytic uh, investment that, as, as our, our keynote speaker said, that particularly there's too much about uh, mobilizing just international finance. Actually, domestic finance is enormous in this, but also the private sector. So from an EFAB perspective, you know, one of the things we're doing a lot of now is looking at new instruments, particularly to look at partnerships with the private sector, with others, um, to try and link that sort of capital. But a lot of the time, particularly in places like Africa, it's that first loss investment that's needed to try and de-risk for bringing in other forms of capital. And that's one of the things we're looking at doing a lot of at the moment. Um, and I think the other thing that we try and do very much through our programs is, you know, is is bring the communities, bring the people into it. Much of the innovation, much of the technology comes from within if you can give them the tools, if you can help with the organization of farmers groups, cooperatives to organize themselves and come up and then provide the finance that can actually allow them to realize their ideas. Okay, before I move over to, to Yara, um, to actually ask him to challenge a bit, are we, um, using the money intelligently is, is where I would like you to, to take us. I want to just pause here around involving the communities because it's something that we say, but just a bit of clarity of how are you actually doing it and what does that actually look like? One of the key things that EFED does uh, is it spends a lot of time working to try and mobilize farmer groups, mobilize women's groups, and use that as the basis for the project design and project implementation, working with government, but very much through farmer organizations, grassroots organizations, rather than directly. And, and it has a major benefit. Um, the other thing I would probably just like to add as well is, 
I think one of the problems with resilience, one of the problems with climate change is it's everyone's problem and no one's problem. You know, this is a cross-cutting issue and this is the problem we all face, even if you, when you go back to smart money, mm -hmm. where do you make those investments? Because no one really owns it and everyone needs to own it, particularly at an institutional level. You know, it does not sit with ministries of agriculture or just ministries of water. We heard this morning, you know, this has to be about the political leadership at the highest level. The whole cabinet has to own it. We all have to own mm -hmm. it. So Arne, coming back to you, are we mobilizing intelligently, investing intelligently? And if not, what should we do differently? Uh, let me start, I think I would like to, because last week the French Minister of Ecology and, and Climate Change decided to, to step down on a live radio show actually. And he said that, you know, the issues ahead of us is clearly painted, but still we don't move with concerted action and urgency. And I think that is the case. I think in the, for Africa especially, I think the next five to ten years will be a defining moment. If you look at the global picture, you know, food systems represent 25% of greenhouse gas emissions. At the same time, the food systems is also the sector that's probably most vulnerable to climate change. So why don't we act more quickly and more concerted, I think is my, my, one of my questions. Just a little bit on Africa, I think, you know, Africa is vulnerable for two th reasons on the food system side. One is that with the demographics, the import cost, the import bill on food is just increasing. It's probably around 30 to 40 billion US dollars now annually. By 2025, it will definitely be above 100 billion US dollars. That means that drought in Australia or in Argentina or in Russia will impact food security on this continent and also potentially food prices. The other one is obviously climate change will impact food production on this continent. If you look at the yield increase from 1990s until today, it's about 30, hectare per, uh, 30 kilos per hectare per year it needs to be 130 kilos per hectare per year. So we have to have a dramatic increase, and we have to do it in a sustainable way. And we have to support those farmers in that process. And we need to combine all the best efforts, that is, the different technologies, as well as agroecology and all the you know, organic you know, means that we can put in place. Uh, I just want to refer to two initiatives that I think, you know, um, one, quite a new one that is more in the global space at the moment, is the Food and Land Use Coalition. What we're trying to do is to bring together the science community and to really help with the modeling and the best insights that we can accumulate, but also to create increased alignment about the science and provide that as support to different countries and governments in their processes. Then mobilize on the solution side. What do we learn? What do we have? How can we really use between the public and the private? Uh, and then help countries almost in a soft system integrations way. So Ethiopia is part of this and other countries are engaging on the continent on this. But I think this is one initiative that is to be looked out for and be involved in. And we've, there will actually be a policy session on Friday that will go more into depth on, on the Food and Land Use Coalition or FOLU as we call it. The other one, and, and uh, sitting here with Ertwin, uh, we both helped to, to initiate something called the Farm to Market Alliance or the uh, patient procurement platform, I guess we called it at the time. Um, but it's, it's, you know, t so it's kind of two or three years in, into it, it's, and it's kind of an incubation stage still. But 150,000 smallholder farmers in East Africa has been you know, benefited, and it's really looking at the demand side. How does these smallholders tap into the margin that is in the supply chain? How can we support them? And then organize you know, risk sharing, um, more affordable finance, better technologies, training, so they can really you know, benefit and become financially sustainable and do that in practices that do good soil management, good farming practices. Um, by now, around those, you know, average those 150,000 smallholder farmers have had an 83% increase in their income. So again, another type of initiative, and it's, it's not, and I'm listening also to the former panel, I think we have a tendency to talk about our own institutions. This is and needs to be a collective action. We, we have to move beyond just looking at our suboptimal solutions, because otherwise this will become too fragmented. Um, and I think another one that was also mentioned in, in, in the opening speech, you know, we have to fight short-termism. You know, we, 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 this will require, this transformation that we are part of and trying to make happen here, will have to have a long-term pathway 
uh, and we have to learn as we go, as, as Sean said from USAID, but, but we have to fight this short-termism because that will not take us to where we need to go. So I'll stop there. Okay. I want to come back to the question of our investment um, because it's very clear that there's things that we should be doing. It should be sustainable. It should be long-term. We should make it evidence-based. We should involve communities. There's a lot of things that, and um, you're mentioning that particular projects and other projects that are happening. So again, to link it back to the earlier session, how do we make it revolutionary? How do we make the transformation happen at a speed that um, allows us to learn, obviously, that allows us to not just rush and, and do things, but that does um, disturb the status quo and that does push us. And um, there has been one, um, trained all day today that's been talking about one aspect of it and that's around irrigation. Um, so I want to, to come to you, Ambassador Cousin, uh, around what that can do and how that can be really transformative. There was a mention this morning by Mama Dubite of uh, Professor Willis from Nairobi University that crops don't need rain, crops need water. So have you, in your discussions today, how do we get the water to the crops? Well. Thank you very much for that question and thank you for this opportunity. I want to thank Agra for this opportunity to participate on behalf of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Let's start though, before we talk about the irrigation issue, with recognizing what the, was said by the farmer on the previous panel. And that is that this is about business and it is about it is about creating that economic opportunity. And uh, economists across the globe agree that by 2030, the African agribusiness opportunity is somewhere around a trillion dollars. This is at the same time that 80% of all of the agriculture produced on the continent is now today produced by smallholders who are impacted by Mm -hmm. Climate change, more erratic rains, lack of access to seeds and tools and finance. And so we talk about how then do we scale up the innovations and the research that we know is working out there to increase the productivity of those smallholder farmers mm -hmm. to ensure that we actually do capture that, five, that, that trillion dollar opportunity. And for a very long time, yes, we have been talking about improved seeds and tools supported by education that are delivered through adequate research and innovation. But we didn't talk about water. But water and the irrigation projects on the continent are not new. There's been tens and hundreds of millions of dollars invested in large cement irrigation projects. What we're now talking about is farmer-led irrigation projects, projects that will empower farmers at, and communities to support the adequate access to the, that water resource that is required whether the rains are erratic or not, mm -hmm. to ensure that we can create and develop the full productivity of the land the farmers cultivate. And when we talk about empowering farmers, I look at this panel and I smile because we must ensure that we are empowering women. Farmers, not just those in the field, but those across the entire agribusiness system. We must ensure that as I look at this audience today, when we get past talking about aid, food aid, and food assistance, when we say we want to target it to the women, and we're now talking about investment and growing a trillion dollar opportunity, the percentage of women in the room gets smaller and smaller every year. And we must affirmatively go out and identify women leaders and include them in this conversation at every level to ensure that as we are developing the plans, as well as the investment policies that are necessary, that we are including the 50% of the farmers in this, in, on this continent who are the women. Absolutely. 
So if, you, if I can take two minutes, I'll talk a bit about the irrigation issue. <laughs> can, can, can I, I actually, couldn't let can that... Can I actually come back to you on the irrigation okay. issue? Because you mentioned something that I think is important for Kisilu to intervene in, because this is something that he mentioned earlier, which is around empowering the farmer. Because again, these are conversations that are being had, and there are words that we say, empowering the farmer, and something that was very clear um, to him earlier today was, we need to be empowered. And I want to ask you, Kisilu, what does that mean to you? What do you mean when you say, we want to be empowered to be able to take advantage of these opportunities? We want to be empowered to be able to make a life out of uh, farming. So I want to hear from you a little bit so that you can integrate that into the conversation before we come back to, to the irrigation issue. <coughs> Uh, according to me and from my film, um, you know, I came to understand that community never knew whether there is something bad happening to the weather. So to create awareness about the climate changing is a very important move. It is creating community readiness. Then, to start training them on good practices, uh, good farming practices, which are harmless to the environment, is another step, you know. And also changing their mindset on uh, not waiting for the government to support on everything, you know. Yeah. To, under to understand that they can start with themselves, and after exhausting themselves then, they lose gaps for others to pop in, you know. Yeah, so whatever I'm doing to my community level is to spread the gospel of climate change, what they are twisting, and the actions which we can take by ourselves to adapt in the meeting days. You, you were also mentioning earlier some of the, the project that you're under that includes irrigation and construction and using um, resources such as water, I think as she was mentioning, and how does that play out in the community in terms of be the trainings, uh, the, the bit around the tools and the construction? <coughs> For example now, uh, you know our community mostly relied on natural rain. Too late to realize that we can uh, so start watering our crops with our own hands. Uh, sometimes after a year or so, gov our government brought um, uh, our irrigation system to set an example and it is working. So to them, they came to realize that surely as the, my friend said here, crops does not need rain, but they need water. Absolutely. Yeah. This is linking back to this farmer-led sure, irrigation yeah. mm -hmm. that is not just this major buildings of, 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 of yeah. irrigation. So thank you for that. Also, um, <laughs> according to me, you know, our area is extremely arid mm -hmm. and the men are moved to town, leaving women there. You know, people may think that we ladies are not uh, powerful in implementing and in doing all these things, but according to me, I love them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, uh, ladies are the most uh, vulnerable when, when we talk of uh, climate challenging and what have you, because men just decide to move and leave them behind. And move to town. They move to town. Also, uh, youth, mm -hmm. second. Yeah. So, 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 according to what we are doing and what I'm requesting our government to do is to support our community, no matter whether they are ladies or what, and also to put this education, uh, this uh, climate change subject into our educational system to sustain the move. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm realizing that uh, we're running out of time, and I do want, with your permission, can we take a few more minutes? Yes, thank you. You guys are nice. Um, or they're just fascinating. Or both. Um, and I know that I do want to come back to you on irrigation, and we do have this statement at the end, but um, I do want to hear from you, Billy, because you seem to have something that you want to add on, uh, yes, on sustainable development yeah, goals. Um, <clears throat> no, I just want to, to uh, talk about two things. I mean, the first uh, and important thing is the kind of um, capacity that we are talking now, you know, the resilience capacity that we are forcing um, in these processes how actually we can you know, have a capacity to absorb 
you know, a shock on unpredictable issues, but at the same time also how we can be part of the ongoing change. So one thing that um, always concerns me is, it is one thing actually to talk about the unpredictable shocks, whether it is um, you know, the, the uh, <clears throat> fall of army worm that um, you know, uh, Simon was talking earlier, or anything of that type. And I mean, it's one thing to, to have that kind of capacity, but it's another thing actually to start you know, living with, with uh, ongoing change because climate change is any, you know, it's no more unpredictable. It's no more actually unforeseen fact. This is a fact that we are living in it right now. So why can't we be, um, you know, vigorous and, and have, um, you know, a kind of necessarily action that will uh, cope up with this situation is something that is really concerning me a lot. So at, at the moment we're talking about drought and floods. This is the strong manifestation of climate consequences in Africa, particularly in Eastern Africa. But um, if you see the reality now, um, these areas that are being affected with, with floods and drought, they have been affected on this thing nearly every year basis in the last 10 years. But we still deceive ourselves. We still keep saying that this is calamities, this is incident. Mm -hmm. We are not taking this thing as a new norm and try to act against it. Okay. So this is one important thing when we are talking about capacity. Um, uh, the second important thing is um, definitely, you know, water is the most important thing here. We're talking about irrigation, we're talking the business. It makes business sense, absolutely from, um, you know, different perspective. But there are times that um, irrigation is a life-saving. There are times that water is as critical as one or two showers that will lead actually, um, you know, to failure of, um, to, um, you know, huge consequences un unless we correct it, you know, without even, you know, the kind of businesses that we are talking by providing all kind of resources that needs to be in place. So I think these two things are extremely essential when we are talking resilience. Thank you. Um, there's, a, there's a running theme that seems to me from the earlier panel, from the keynote from the earlier panel from this one, is the need for data and the need to use data to inform policy and to not just use data at the national level, but to also understand what the needs, the requirements, and the real um, experiences of people are to inform policy, but also to support those that are the farmers that are the majority and that need that support. So that's definitely um, a theme running through. I know that um, we're running out of time, but I do want to hear again from, from all of you, and I know that, that you want to say a few words. So I'll ask you um, to say a few words. But also, like I was asking the earlier panel, and I will finish with you, I'm, I'm, I still have you on my, on my radar because I want that voice um, to, to take us home, um, is because we say we need to and we should, but I'd like to be a little bit more concrete um, than we need to because we can have a lot of you know, thoughts about that. But can we be a little more concrete about one thing that as organizations we can do because we you know, governments need to, that's true. Institutions need to, that's true. People need, but can we act, you know, is there one actionable thing that we can propose that is something that will take us forward? So in your two words, can you add that perhaps in, you know, two and a half seconds? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> you no, I want that, I want, because I know that um, you, you will start with, with the irrigation, but I also know that we'll come back to it at the end. So yes, go ahead. Okay, uh, let me, give just close out on irrigation by saying, um, because I appreciate you coming in on the issue of irrigation as well, the, the reality is, is, as a good friend of mine always says, if we continue to do what we always have done, we will get the results that we've always received. Absolutely. And uh, innovation and technology are key to addressing the issues related to irrigation or providing water. Because water, as we've said, is what is required for agriculture, whether it is addressing the challenges of droughts or the, trust, the, the challenges of floods and ensuring that we can make the tools that are available help us leapfrog the challenges that other countries and have developed through irrigation. Um, by, and 
can, while leapfrogging those challenges, also make agriculture more productive here on the continent. And that will require increased government and private sector financial investment. And investment not just in tools, but in education and in, a, in adaption of those tools. And the reality of it is that if we want to ensure that we are achieving the SDGs and we are making the smallholder farmers more resilient, that it will require the type of collective action from the, the parties that you've heard from here today, private sector, institutions, government, civil society, academia, as well as the farmers and community. And with water, this is particularly important. Because one of the challenges that we have with water is that the community of agriculture and the clean water, the, what we call the washed community, the water, sanitation, and health communities don't talk to each other. And as we begin to grow the uh, irrigation, the activities on the continent, it will require that we manage between coherent policies on, on the agriculture side as well as on the wash side to ensure that we can appropriately use the, the water resource across the continent. And that means national legislation, but also regulatory frameworks that are driven by and led by community leaders. Okay. And finally, let me just say, and I will close on this, because you asked, what is it that we can do? The, I, I'm excited, because irrigation and water weren't talked about last year at this conference. And now it's a priority issue for AGRA. And in November, the African Union and heads of state will come together to develop a continental, an African continental irrigation strategy for the first time Thanks. to ensure that what we are talking about here becomes a reality across the continent. Okay, thank you. Uh, Arne, you wanted to? Yeah, I, I think I would like to just close with uh, elaborately with around one word, and that is trust. Um, because I think one is that we need strong collaboration. And if I go five to 10 years back, I think there was more somehow optimism around public and private partnership. Obviously, there are variations from country to country on this. But I think for us as a company, I mean, we've been on the continent for 50 years. The last couple of years, we've probably invested something like 150 million US dollars in Eastern Southern Africa. But it's a more difficult environment to operate. Uh, there is less collaboration between the public and private to, to work out and also with the civil society. You know, we all need to actually work together and, and find common solutions. And I think this perspective of shared value needs to be instilled in a stronger way. And I think also, as was mentioned, you know, the, the smart farmers, I mean, the, the farmers needs also to be at the, somewhat the center of this. And I think we tend to, yes, we talk about the farmers, but, but they are not really actually at the center. So, there needs to be a solutions driven by what will actually help the farmer uh, and not by other you know, reasons. I think that's, uh, that's needed. Thank you. Um, Dr. Noel Brown? No, I, I want to, we, we had an agreement, you remember? So I, I want to finish with that. So did you have a, a one word? Yes. So sort of two things really. I mean, for me, it's about the voice of the small farmer who's often the poorest and it's often not heard in policy or to respond. So how do we, how do we support and organize that voice mm -hmm. to be heard? Um, and it's not, you know, and so one of the things, for example, in IFAB, we hold the, interna uh, the International Land Alliance, we host it because very often we're talking about all this, but no one's gonna invest if, as we've heard, farmers don't have any security of even, they don't even have to have land titles, but they have to have some sort of security. So, you know, how do we get that voice? How do we organize? Because if, you, if, if farmers are organized, you're able to provide services. Actually, in the end, you know, irrigation systems, we're not going to manage them. Farmers are going to manage them. But the most successful ones are managed as a community, not as an individual. So, you know, how do we organize and get that voice? And linked to that, I think very clearly is... For me, the biggest challenge is finance. 
and we've heard that. And actually, we have opportunities and we're not taking them. You know, that's why we've got to get out the, of the box of donor finance, aid, whatever. And it's about partnerships. How can we you know, link the best of public and private finance, as I said earlier? We're just about to launch the ABC fund in that context. But it, it's, it's also reaching beyond that. You know, we've got COP2020 coming up. There'll be lots of talk around national commitments. How do we make adaptation to climate change for smallholder farmers a central theme of COP2020? Um, because there will be a lot of finance that we can harvest there for it. Great. So there'll be the two things, I'll do. Thank you. Tony? Wayne. Thanks very much, Valerie. So three quick things uh, I think I'll do. Um, I work for an international organization that has been alive for 40 years, and we've received $1.2 billion, and we have a $1.2 billion legacy of knowledge products and tools. And they largely sit on the shelf. And, and tools are a bit like... Um, a toothbrush, everyone wants to use their own. And we will seek to put those knowledge products into knowledge services, design input, decision support, delivery options for people, that, that's very important. So we will translate those knowledge products into knowledge services that people can use. I think the second thing is around, and, and it's partly what Donald said, around land health. 40% of African soils are degraded. If we don't do something about it, the nightmare of climate change is gonna be even worse. So thinking about those investments, targeted investments, that, and realizing that land health is continental wealth. Mm -hmm. And the third point, and perhaps more frivolous based on our agreement, would be, I mean, AGRA are the ultimate um, champions of agricultural transformation in Africa, and, and we should recognize AGRA for their fantastic um, inputs. But we can all be agents of land transformation in Africa. Mm -hmm. And Valerie, remember, those people who champion land transformation live longer. Those people who champion land transformation have more friends. <laughs> and thirdly, those people who champion land transformation enjoy a better love life. <laughs> and if you don't believe us, just try it and see. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much to all of you. Um, I would like to make sure that I um, and by um, uh, I had a conversation I, with Kisilu. Sorry, I have two points. My last point. One point. All right. No, no. <clears throat> I um, just want to um, underscore one important thing. I believe um, the adaptation agenda um, for Africa is not really taking the right route right now. We need to push this agenda. We, okay. um, <clears throat> I think um, within the adaptation, again, one important single factor right now is water. And uh, this is uh, very important. We want to focus particularly, um, you know, if we have to support smallholder farmers on the green water revolution. The water that actually help recharge itself and also help actually um, becoming an, a critical input for the life-saving irrigation that I Thank was you. mentioned earlier. For all of this, the most important thing is finance. Right now, we're saying that we have enough finance, but I am not sure this finance works for smallholders. I'm not sure this finance is working for the kind of issues that we are discussing today. So we need a different financial order. Thank you very much. I will also use this moment because so many have talked about it and it's my prerogative as moderator so I get to do that. Um, and I'll take one minute because a lot of the conversation that we've had today has been about the smallholder farmer, has been about the fact that resources are available, has been about the fact that we support smallholder farmers. So I'll put you a challenge to that because right here sitting next to my left, and he will not do it himself, so I will do it for him, is saying, I'm here and I'm at this conference and I would like to meet partners that I can get partnerships with and you know, either lessons or, or um, 
tools or resources of some kind, because one of the things, again, is that large conferences, the smallholder farmer is not necessarily as represented, or is not, that does not necessarily have access to the type of partnership or the type of access that some others do have. So I was going to say that at the end of this panel, please reach out to Kisulu. No, get to find out where his movie is. Um, hand him your business card, because there is a potential there to start making sure that those links are more than conversations about the fact that those links are happening, that those links, hopefully next year, when AGRF meets again, this would have been a real partnership through either a pilot or something that would have happened. So thank you all, and thank you to this panel. Thank you for all of you. But I will ask you not to leave. Do not leave, because you're so beautiful all sitting there. And there's one more thing that we have to do before we leave, and that's linked to the um, irrigation communique and next steps, because all day today, they've been talking about irrigation, and something concrete has come out of that that will orient us to next steps. So these conversations, the great thing is when we actually see that the conversation are leading to something that will have an impact. So I would like to take the opportunity to call Professor Nu Atibu, who uh, you are here. Please come on to just read the communique, and that will close the day for today. Hello there. We had a very, very successful irrigation side event today. It was attended by five ministers, and they stayed put for five hours discussing how to expand, rapidly expand irrigation for the smallholder farmers. Now, before I start, I want to remove something that really irritates me when people talk about smallholders and commercial. There is nothing like that. You can be smallholder and be commercial, and therefore it is about making the smallholders as commercial as anybody. That's what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. We know that there's going to be a joint Kigali declaration that will come out on, on, on a Saturday with the president. So this is our proposal of what needs to go to that declaration with respect to irrigation. The irrigation event today, as I said, it was graced by government, farm organization, private agribusinesses, financial institutions, international development organizations, academics, NGOs, and civil society. And we had a good learning session from Asia, what happened there. And there's only one message that I want to put before I define what farmer-led smallholder irrigation is, I want to say this so that you really listen to that definition, is the fact that in the last 50 years, smallholder irrigation has added more land into irrigation in Asia than what large-scale, government-driven irrigation did for 200 years. Now, from that fact, the side event is calling for support to what we call farmer-led irrigation for smallholder farmers' enterprises. Smallholders can be enterprising as well. So, farmer led irrigation for smallholder enterprises. In order to be most effective and sustainable, we are proposing that going forward, irrigation expansion, as already proven by Asian experience, must be farmer led and high tech led. My friend, Ambassador Kozin, talked about leapfrogging. The irrigation that did the magic in India and the other Asian countries was diesel and petrol powered. Africa does not have to go through that route. And we are calling for leapfrogging straight from manual powered irrigation to solar powered irrigation. So we are calling 
for actions to address the need to provide an enabling policy environment and innovative financing that will back this leapfrogging means and policies for catalyzing private sector and public sector investments in a coordinated way to provide appropriate incentives and risk mitigation tools to ensure that small scale commercial farmers, especially the poor women and youth, can access modern and high technology through private supply chain. And certainly, if you go solar, that private supply chain itself will be small scale and very attractive to the youth. Integrated evidence-based knowledge and collective action in farmland irrigation to promote sustainable water resource management. It is very important because what is made a difference in Asia was groundwater irrigation. Everybody is worried that we may deplete it, but we are saying it can be managed. And the conditions of groundwater in Africa are really very, very conducive to this process. But certainly, we need good resource management. Build capacity and adapt technologies to monitor and access the welfare and resource impacts of farmer-led irrigations at every level. Therefore, recognizing the critical role of farmer-led irrigation, as defined above, to achieve food security, wealth creation, and transformation of agriculture in general in Africa, the partners who met today are proposing that the Kigali Declaration says this. We need greater recognition by all stakeholders of the importance of irrigation and water management for ending hunger in Africa, creating wealth, and eradicating poverty as per Malabo Declaration as well as the SDGs. We acknowledge the potential, acceleration, and value of farmer-led irrigation as a tool to accelerate these aims and the need to, uh, for adoption of public and private sector approaches to saving smallholder commercial farmer needs. Push for investment in what we call distributed irrigation technologies, which means technologies that can be owned and operated by individuals. Monitoring to ensure sustainability and innovative financing to enable greater risk taking by private sector actors seeking to deliver services to farmers and for smallholders seeking to adapt them. Push for a concerted engagement with existing and new platforms and service providers such as farm organizations, cooperatives, market operators, and agro dealers to better understand challenges and opportunities of scaling farmer-led irrigation. Support for a common learning agenda and mechanism for knowledge and experience sharing across public sector, private sector, civil society, farmers, and academia. And finally, review existing policies and investment approaches to ensure that they deliver better for expanding rapidly farmer-led irrigation in Africa. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, and on that note, I would like to thank again the panelists, and thank yourselves for staying this late. It is seven o'clock. I realize what's standing between you and cocktails and drinks and food is the end of the session. Thank you for coming. Um, thank you for participating as much as you could. And uh, we will see you tomorrow. I'm the
so I want to fish you. Yeah. But then it happens to force, make I miss you. Yeah. Busy on the morning, my bad DJ. Yeah. My bad freaking freaking what my bad replay. Yeah. I like the way you shake down the tape. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, bump, bump, bigger than bump, yeah. yeah. Put it on me, I'm a mala soup. Yeah. 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 I just wanna call you out. Yeah, but they 